um, next question is judges 11 30 to 40 does God permit the human sacrifice well, no the, the text doesn't say I mean that's a quick and easy one um, you're referring I'm trying to pull it up here you're, you're referring to Jephthah right and the, yeah. the, the rash vow that he makes yes yeah in scripture uh, it it, it, it's very clear that a person is, you know, when it comes to oaths and vows, a person is only to swear in the name of God. That's why Jesus condemns the Pharisees in Matthew 5 for swearing by the temple and the hairs of their head and all this other stuff. You're only to swear by God. You're only to make lawful vows and oaths. You, you can't make a vow or oath that goes against the law of God. That's immediately nullified, right? Uh, you can't vow, uh, I'm going to murder. God says thou shalt not murder. So no vow is lawful uh, in the case of, uh, in that kind of case. You also have the fact that a father has the right to nullify uh, uh, his, his child's vow if, if it's made by an underage child and he hears about it and so forth. He can, he can nullify it because he, you know, he, they don't have the confidence to make, uh, if he judges that they don't have the, the confidence to make that vow just yet, that he can do that. So, so not all vows are automatically, you know, it's not like they bind God, right? God isn't bound uh, to honor uh, some uh, horrendous promise. I mean, even a Muslim would recognize that, I would think, when, when you know, Muhammad had, uh, Muhammad even gave Muslims the allowance to break vows and oaths yeah. that were not unlawful, right? Uh, God in the Bible doesn't allow that. If a person makes a lawful oath or vow, they have to keep it. But uh, in Scripture, it's very clear uh, uh, that, that God never commanded human sacrifices. In fact, he commanded animal sacrifices. Uh, and uh, two, uh, there's no command here to, to Jephthah. There's no promise of reward for what Jephthah did. Um, and uh, I mean, so there, there's just nothing here. What Muslims are doing is people have to make a distinction between what we can call prescriptive ethics excuse me, prescriptive ethics and descriptive ethics. Prescriptive means what God has commanded, what he has prescribed. Descriptive ethics means describing what somebody does, right? Often in scripture, what you have are a description, a historical account of something that happened. You can't assume just because the account tells you what happened that it's, it's saying that it, that it was a good thing. Right. The Bible uh, records that Satan tempted man to sin just because it records what Satan did doesn't mean it's saying what Satan did was good. That's foolish. Right. The Bible has history in it and it records historical events. It's a mistake to automatically assume if an event is recorded, therefore something is being commanded. That's just not the case. Uh, so that's that's a huge mistake that Muslims are making. And part of the reason they make that mistake is because they look at Muhammad and think that his actions are normative, that his actions actually are the pattern of conduct. And so when they look at Old Testament figures like Jephthah, they assume that if he did it, then people are to follow his sunnah, right? Uh, they're to follow the sunnah of Moses, the sunnah of Abraham, the sunnah of David. Uh, well, they also think people are to follow the sunnah of Jephthah. That's not how Christians read the Old Testament. That's not how the Old Testament teaches us to read it. Uh, this account is not being given to us as an example of something to follow, but rather as, I would argue, an, a warning against making rash vows. Now, there are also debates, by the way, over how this is properly to be even rendered and interpreted. You know, some people would argue that the sacrifice being referred to here doesn't refer to a literal sacrifice, uh, but to... Uh, uh, basically to a dedication in the sense of, because uh, the word can be used that way, that he, he's not literally sacrificing her up uh, as an offering for sin, but rather pledging her to the service of the temple or to the priests or, or what have you. And so uh, I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying that uh, in, in either case, there's just not a problem here because uh, God didn't command Jephthah to do this. Jephthah uh, doesn't have uh, any divine warrant for doing this, and there's no uh, reward for what he did. Uh, so the the text just doesn't present this in a positive way. Yeah, and um, we are reading Bible um, during the lockdown, and we recently read this passage. I think we kind of all agreed it is one of the darkest 
um, passage and shows how human hearts are so far away from God. Um, that shows the need of Lord Jesus Christ. So he was filled with Holy yeah, Spirit, so yet he sacrificed uh, or killed his daughter. Yeah, so a couple of problems here for, for the uh, critic. Number one, I didn't uh, say that she wasn't killed. I was pointing out that there are scholars who argue that case, and they would easily, I think, uh, answer his objection by simply observing that when uh, notice that because she's being dedicated, if if that's the answer that she's being dedicated to the Lord's service, it means that she would not be allowed to marry. She would not be able to have descendants. His line would be cut off in this way, uh, at least through her. And so that's a a uh, scenario for mourning, right? Uh, he has no descendants now that are going to come through her. She's certainly going to mourn that she no longer gets to be a mother in Israel. Uh, that would have been a great blessing to a woman. And certainly, you know, for most women, you know, they want to have that, they want to have children. And they, you know, throughout the Old Testament, not being able to have a child was a source of great, great uh, lamentation for women. So that that I don't think is an objection to those who hold that position. But again, that's that's not something I was offering as my position, only that it's the argument of some. Now, the other one might have some plausible uh, ring to it, right? He's filled with the Spirit of God. So how can you say that his uh, oath is, is uh, sinful and not really something that God himself uh, commends? Well, this just shows no real famili familiarity with the book of Judges. Throughout the book of Judges, the, the judges in Israel are these people that God is raising up and empowering to be victorious against Israel's enemies who are being able to uh, overpower them or somehow oppress them. So the activity of the Spirit in the book of Judges is not so much a sanctifying activity where he's making these people holy. Rather, it's an empowering thing. That's why uh, it's always connected to these great feats of power, like Jephthah being able to overcome uh, you know, uh, uh, people. Right? It says in verse 29, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Man, uh, Ammon. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand. Notice, again, the, the whole idea is that the Spirit of the Lord is coming upon him to empower him to engage in this kind of military uh, victory. The same thing was true of Samson, whom nobody could claim had uh, uh, you know, a great moral character and was doing things that God would have approved of. Samson was given what? Great strength by God to perform great feats on behalf of Israel, uh, waylaying Philistines and so forth. But over and over again throughout the account, Samson is a sinful individual. Over and over again, the problems, I mean, just, just look at the account of Samson. Most people know about Samson and Delilah, but all throughout the accounts, the, the, the problem is always Samson and some uh, pagan woman, right? He's always getting himself involved with some pagan woman, which leads him to get angry and upset. And then he goes out and starts waylaying uh, the enemies of God because those pagan women came from those pagan people. So just because it says the spirit of God came upon someone doesn't mean the spirit of God came upon them to become, uh, you know, these uh, paragons of moral virtue. Rather, the Spirit of God comes upon them to become the agents of God in exacting uh, retribution or vengeance upon God's enemies. So, again, it's just a mistake in reading the whole book of Judges.